right. who is he? Uh, there's a website link that I will go ahead and copy and put in the chat room so you can see yourself. Uh, Everett's written a few books, including most importantly, the, uh, the book that we're discussing tonight and a few books, both for men and women of battling temptation, as it says here, strategies for conquering temptation, one directed for young men and one for ladies. Uh, but he's lived it. He has absolutely lived the faith and lived youth ministry. He has had one of those mega youth groups, which he references in his book. And when discussing with those, I call it alumni for young people that have gone through his program about what really works in their faith formation, uh, it's actually the small group, which has kind of led him to his aha moments, which he'll share with you. Since he's been able to travel around the country and share his knowledge. Uh, it's a lot easier, of course, to travel around the country now via Zoom. Uh, and he's been a consultant and speaker for quite a few years now. However, his best ministry is with his wife and uh, four children. Three, Three children, uh, all stuck at home, which is why he's locked himself in the basement to be with us tonight. <laughs> I appreciate the time, Everett. I will open us up with prayer, Mary here. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your response is pray for us. Our Lady of Knock. Pray for us. Our Lady of Sorrows. Pray for us. Refuge of Sinners. Pray for us. Queen Assumed into Heaven. Pray for us. Pray for us. Queen of the Rosary. Pray for us. Mother of Nazareth. Pray, pray, for pray for us. Queen of virgins. Pray for us. Helper of Christians. Pray for us. Healer of the sick. Pray for us. Queen of peace. Pray for us. Our Lady, Mother of the Church. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Slides. All right, I got about 20 minutes to give us something meaningful to talk about uh, and and to reflect on. Uh, so, um, and so uh, again, I should, it's, should say thank you, Stephen, for having me, uh, and uh, it's a blessing to be able to to be with you all tonight. As Stephen mentioned, I am from Denver, Colorado. I run a, an organization called Saint Andrew Green Missionaries, which uh, is to help. Uh, Catholic institutions shift their approaches with young people to uh, um, stuff that is effective, essentially. So our goal is, uh, um, so Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew twenty-eight sixteen. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is our mission of the, uh, as a church. That's why we do what we do, which is the end goal, the me measure of success in ministry is, are we making lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ? Uh, if you, um, I, I want to share an anecdote with you real quick. I am a, a uh, in Denver, Colorado, I, I've lived here for 10 years. That's where our, our roots are now as a family. But I grew up just outside of Chicago. Uh, so I am a, a massive Cubs fan. Uh, and did ridic there's, the folklore around like Cubs fandom is, is hilarious, really. Uh, the only thing they didn't try doing uh, in order to win a World Series was putting a good baseball team on the field. Uh, that was the, the biggest issue. Until, until uh, like 2011, they hired Theo Epstein, and Theo Epstein said, we need to change the culture of our team. He says, in order to get to some place we haven't been before, we have to be willing to go to try things we haven't done before. And they famously brought in a, a manager by the name of Joe Madden, uh, who had was a great baseball mind and great baseball manager, but he also had a reputation for being quirky and doing really interesting things to inspire his team and to get different results. Uh, and I could tell you story after story of things that Joe Madden did, but I, I, one example, they, they asked Joe Madden, they were in the process of renovating Wrigley Field. And one of the things they were doing is they were renovating the clubhouse, which was no better than like a high school locker room because the stadium is so old. And so they were trying to make it state of the art. They're like, hey, look, we need top notch equipment for our guys. So they asked Joe, they said, you can have anything you want in this new locker room for your players. What do you want? And he said, I want a victory room. And, and they said, well, what, what is that? He says, well, I want a victory room because like, you're going to put really nice stuff in our uh, locker room. And, and when we win ball games and spray each other down with champagne and water and whatever, and, and celebrate, we says, I don't want to destroy the furniture and destroy the equipment and everything. And they're like, oh, so you want a room for like when we win the world series? He says, no, 
I want a victory room that we can go in to celebrate after every single win at our stadium. And they were like, wait, you're going to celebrate like you won the World Series after every win in the season? He says, yes. I don't want my players to take winning for granted. I want them to look forward to winning because I want them to look forward to the celebration that we have afterwards. And they do. They have a victory room off of the locker room at Wrig Wrigley Field, and they have a, a, a um, smoke machine in it and a disco ball and, like, a DJ station. And they celebrate like crazy after every single win. Um, he famously has a slogan uh, every year that he, he would put on a T-shirt in spring training as a motto for the team. The year they won the World Series, the motto was try not to suck. Um, I love Joe Madden because in order, like the way in which he thinks is in order to get to some place I haven't been before, get my team to think differently, get different results um, to win the World Series in this case, uh, he said we have to be willing to think outside the box and approach things uh, from a different angle. Now I bring that up because um, we're not in the business of trying to win worlds in the uh, much more important business, which is trying to bring souls to heaven. Uh, you could say it's the most important business there is. And the troubling reality in the Catholic Church today is that one in 10 Americans is a former Catholic. So of the 300 million plus people in America, uh, we have over 30 million that are former Catholics, which means you meet 10 people on the side of the road one day, or you walk past 10 people, one of them has already left the Catholic Church. Um, and not only that, but there are there is study after study after study that is done that is showing that we are losing our young people in droves. In fact, when people leave the church, they do so young. I was looking at a, um, a study. Oh, who was it done by? I can't remember. Uh, but the study essentially said that we lose 85% uh, of our, our young people after confirmation. Uh, Pew Research Study, which is probably a little bit more accurate in terms of, because they do massive studies, um, they say that 79% of those who become not affiliated are the fastest growing religion being not affiliated, uh, leave the church by their 23rd birthday. So um, not only are we losing people in our church, that people are walking away from Catholicism and saying, this gospel, this good news, this um, uh, this uh, salvation and life that Jesus Christ has given to us, that's not for me. That this isn't something that's important to me or even relevant to my life, um, which is a tragedy if people uh, encounter the gospel and they come to that conclusion. Um, when people come to that conclusion, they're doing so when they're young. Uh, so it's imperative that we, and this has been the case for decades. It, it, you can look back at study after study after study for the last several decades, and it's all been coming to the same conclusion. We're losing our young people in the church today. Um, and, and so, and I say that uh, uh, to share with you um, uh Something that I noticed several years ago in, in attending Steubenville, I think one summer I attended like two Steubenville youth conferences for uh, different reasons. And then I attended World Youth Day in uh, Spain. And I saw like thousands of young people at these youth conferences. Uh, and I, you could look at uh, NC and FCYM, they have 20 some thousand young people that come to it. Go to World Youth Day, there's 2 million young people there. And then I think to myself, where are all these young people when they get back to their churches, when they get back to their parishes, like we throw a really good party in the church. We really can spark people in their faith. But why is it that um, what, that when they get back to their everyday life, they're leaving? Um, Pope Francis said something in his, in his very first document that uh, he released, Evangelii Gaudium, where he really explains kind of where his heart is uh, in, in terms of his, where his papacy is. And he, he talks about um, the church today, and he says, I dream of a missionary option that is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled to the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. The second Pope Francis is saying in this, and this caught my eye, because he says, the church needs to be missionary. The, the idea of a missionary is that a missionary goes out into a culture and into a world, learns and gains the trust of that culture and that world, and, um, and adapts their approach to meet, to speak the language of the culture that they're speaking to. Uh, and um, I, I love what he says here because he's essentially identifying what I see as one of the greatest problems in the church today is that we have a maintenance mindset, that the way in which we're doing things, our times and schedules, language and structures, um, they're, not, they're not channeled towards meeting the needs of people today. They're channeled towards this is the way we've always done things, which is the antithesis of the way the Holy Spirit works. 
uh, if you if you ever want to know if somebody's following the Holy not following the Holy Spirit, if they if the words that they utter out of their mouth is well, this is the way we've always done it. And it's like then you're not following the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't doesn't uh, do things the same way over and over and over again. Uh, the Holy Spirit makes it new. Uh, I wanted to find a couple of words here because I'm going to use the word discipleship, and I'm also going to use the words youth ministry. Uh, uh, in the words uh, youth ministry, real quick, uh, it, because I only have 20 minutes, but the words youth ministry, uh, I think it, it really misunderstood because a lot of times when we talk about the words youth ministry, we immediately think of like youth group or we think of uh, our classes with young people, but youth ministry is much larger than that. Uh, youth uh, if you break it down, youth, youth culture uh, is um, something that is different, that didn't exist 60 or 70 years ago. Uh, there, 60 or 70 years ago, there, uh, people were coming back from World War II, and for the first time ever, uh, there was a, a device that was in people's homes that gave marketers a way to get into homes in a way that they'd never been before, and that is the television. Um, now, you can say radios before that, but television started doing something different. They realized, the companies started realizing that young people had more disposable income than uh, their parents did. And so they started to create products uh, for young people and market it to them. And so the, for the first time ever, marketing started to be uh, to, uh, in a way to young people that um, if you wear clothes this way or if you have a style of music this way, it's different than that of what your parents will like. Um, this had actually never been done before in marketing. That young people started to be marketed to as having their own way of life, their own way of dressing, their own way of talking, their own music, their own house, their own center of, of uh, relationships, etc. And then uh, after the 1960s happened, and if you remember the 1960s or have studied them like uh, like I have, because I'm not that old, uh, but if you if you know about the 1960s, it was a tumultuous time in life. Um, you had the drug revolution, sex revolution, you had Vatican Council II, which um, was a, a very important council and one that is uh, brought a, a lot of good to the church, but um, there was a lot of confusion that came out of Vatican Council II as well. And then there was like an anti-authoritarianism that rose up in the 1960s as well. As well. Then you look at young people today, and you see what, what it is that, that, that they are stereotyped as, and a lot of these stereotypes can be true, that they are anti-authoritarian, that they mistrust religion, um, and have confusion around it, uh, that they have, um, that they struggle with drugs and sex and, and alcohol and things of that nature. Um, this is, uh, as I believe Walt Mueller puts it, this is uh, the soup that they're marinated in. Uh, they are, have grown up in this culture. A new culture has developed, and this is what uh, they are raised in. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you could say that uh, young people today are their own like culture. Uh, and the church's response when we discover a new civilization is to send missionaries to it. Uh, and the missionaries um, don't go in and they don't say, here, uh, if, for example, I think I say in my book, uh, if, if a missionary uh, or if the church discovered that there was a um, cannibal tribe that had uh, been discovered off the coast of some remote island that they didn't know existed, and they sent missionaries there because they said, we're going to take seriously our, our role uh, and our duty to make disciples of all nations. So new culture of cannibals, we're going to go share the gospel with them. And on the first day, the missionaries walk up to the chief of the tribe and they explain to him that the way that they're living is wrong and that uh, they have a better way of life. And so in order to teach them this new way of life, they're going to teach them, they're going to set up classes that the uh, tribe can come to every week. And in those classes, we're going to teach them our liturgy and our, uh, our catechism and our prayers and Latin, uh, a language that, which they don't understand. Uh, we're going to teach them these things. What's going to happen to those missionaries? They're going to be eat like their dinner that night. Um, that, that, thankfully, though, a missionary, if they're well-trained, they don't go into a new civilization with that mindset. They don't go into a civilization immediately thinking, here's what I have to teach you. They go into a civilization not, uh, not with the uh, intention of becoming dinner. Uh, they go in with the intention of being invited to dinner. Like their intention, a mis effective missionaries go and they win the hearts of the culture and tribe that they're in. They learn that tribe's language of what they value, and then they teach according to what that tribe values. Uh, 
And you could say today that that's what youth ministry is called to. We're called to be missionaries into youth culture, uh, like replace cannibal tribe with young people. And that's what we have today. Uh, in addition to that ministry, the word ministry is it's used all the time. I define ministry as meeting the needs of people. Uh, I think COVID-19 has exposed a lot of, of maintenance in the church today. And I think that's actually a good thing is that uh, COVID-19 happened, this pandemic happened, and overnight, the needs of people changed. And overnight, parishes' resources changed. They had to rethink the way they were doing things. But people's needs changed overnight. And um, Catholic institutions right now that are thriving are the ones who immediately moved into the mindset of what are the new needs of the people I have to serve and how do I meet those needs? And those that are falling apart are the ones who had a maintenance mindset because their mindset became, well, here's what I have to teach. Um, and so how do I make that now virtual? Uh, because that's the only way we can meet now is I'm going to take the curriculum and the program that I've been running and I'm going to find a way to do it virtually. And that is going to be a massive failure uh, because it's not meeting the needs of the people today third word that I use frequently, discipleship. A discipleship is uh, something that is uh, thousands of years old. It's a method of ministry that Jesus did, that the ancient Jews did. And essentially what it, what it was in, in three things is it was a process. It was about practicing disciplines and it was an apprenticeship. So when you hear the terms discipleship used in the gospel, discipleship was uh, something where a, a rabbi would go and evaluate um, the graduates of the school as they were graduating. And if they were the best of the best, the rabbi would invite that young person and they would say, come and follow me. And that, that uh, uh, disciple then, that young person had an opportunity of a lifetime. They would go and they would live with the rabbi and they would learn from the rabbi's very way of life. And, uh, and in doing so, they became uh, began to imitate the rabbi if they were doing so. They imitated the disciplines of the rabbi. They went through a process in their life of um, coming and crossing thresholds in their life. And they had new opportunities that came up as a result of this apprenticeship. It was a great opportunity. The other thing that the rabbi might say is that if they weren't the best, the best he would say, go and learn the trade of your father. Um, and if, if you've ever wondered why is it that the apostles, uh, in particular Peter and, and his brothers, uh, and his brother Andrew and, and James and John, why they dropped their nets when Jesus extended the invitation, come and follow me, uh, it's because um, what are they doing when Jesus finds them? They're doing the trade of their father. They're fishermen. Uh, their opportunity had come and gone, and they were not the best of the best. And Jesus op offered them a second chance. And so they drop their nets immediately and take him up on that opportunity. They're not even good fishermen, by the way. Like it, it always says in the Bible, they, they, if Jesus is not with them, they fished all night and they caught nothing. But when Jesus is with them, they have like a catch of a lifetime. Uh, so <laughs> they're, they're terrible fishermen on top of that. So this is a, a great opportunity for them. And I often think about what is it that – uh, the apostles learned um, simply by watching Jesus brush his teeth in the morning or watching his morning routine or how he dealt with difficult situations or difficult people or, um, or what it was uh, that, he, that he would do in terms of his prayer life and in his routine with prayer and disciplines. Uh, like that education uh, was worth way more than anything Jesus actually said to them. Learning from his very example is, is uh, the way in which Jesus intended for us to pass on the faith, that our faith cannot be communicated simply by books or simply by classes or by you know, sharing catechism. Our faith has to be caught by demonstration and imitation and inspiration, uh, that when somebody lives an inspiring life, you say, yes, I want to do that too. Uh, now, I share this um, with you because uh, uh, Steve alluded to it, and I mentioned it in my book. Uh, when I was a youth minister, probably about 10 years ago, I, I had a, a booming youth group, and I had just moved out to Colorado and left a booming youth group that I had started from the ground up in Florida. And that youth group uh, went from zero to 100 at a very small uh, like parish with limits of resources. And then I, I took over a, a large parish in Colorado where I had a lot of resources and, um, but the youth group had been underperforming. And so uh, immediately we started implementing some of the same things I did in Florida and our numbers at youth group went way up. And I felt really good about this until one day I was preparing a, a set of youth groups that I, the youth groups that I was going to do on Sunday evenings. Uh, and I was sitting at my desk and I looked at a picture of the Florida group uh, of about 100 teens that I'd taken to a stimulant youth conference uh, three years prior. 
and and I looked in that picture and I honed in on a particular team that I knew had left the faith. And I was like, oh, I really should pray for that person. And I looked at the person next to him. I was like, that person left the faith too. And, and the person next to him, I know, I know where they're at in their life too. And they've left the faith. Uh, and I started to get really concerned. And, and I started counting in the picture how many of the kids I knew were no longer practicing their faith when they hit college. And I started even like social media stalking because some of them I didn't know. Like I got really concerned. And do you know what I found? The number of young people that were still practicing their faith out of those 100 uh, were 10, 10 out of 100, uh, that 90 of them had left the faith. And uh, what was interesting, too, is that the 10 were incredibly devout Catholics, really faithful, like uh, pious vocations, uh, serving in, even to this day, uh, marriage and family, serving in the church and doing amazing things. Like those 10 became a, incredibly devout, holy young people. And then 90 left. And I was really troubled by this. Um, I was like, why is there such a difference? And why, why did 90 leave and 10 stay? And two days later, I was having lunch with a, a mentor of mine who was also youth minister. He built a massive youth group of, and had been in youth ministry 25 years. And he asked me, he's like, how's everything? Paris? I was like, oh, great. And like, we're doing all this stuff this summer. And like, our numbers are way up at youth group. And the kids seem to be really enjoying it. And he says, that's interesting. How many of the young people in your, in your youth group right now do you think are going to become lifelong followers? I was like, wait, what? He's like, how many are going to become lifelong followers? And I found myself, I, was, I started making excuses. I was like, well, the guy's name was Jim. I said, Jim, like, it's not about the numbers, you know? And, and if I just had more resources and, oh, my pastor can be so difficult to work with sometimes. Oh, and let me tell you about what, how difficult my parents are. Man, if these parents could get with the program, they, they just don't prioritize their faith and said, stop, stop. You're making excuses. How many young people are becoming lifelong followers coming out of your program? And, uh, and you know, he was hitting me. I was like, how is it that you know that something is really troubling me? And so I said, Jim, if I'm being honest, 10 out of 100, please don't tell my pastor. <laughs> and uh, uh, we started talking. And in those conversations, uh, he said, yeah, I see the same thing in, in just about every large ministry that I run. There's a small percentage that become really devout. And then there's a, there's a huge number that leave the faith. And I, I said, well, why is that? He's like, well, think about it. What's, what did you do with those 10 that you didn't do with the other 90? And I thought about it. I said, you know, I had this, this smaller group that I met with during, during the week. It was a, like a leadership group that I ran of teenagers, but it really was my excuse to, to form deeper. Like in order to be part of the leadership, you had to come to Bible study regularly. You had to come to these meetings with me. And I mentioned these kids' prayer lives and I got to know them and their, their issues in their life really, really well and built really strong relationships with them and their parents, mentored their parents. Uh, you know, we uh, taught them scripture, taught, you know, like, uh, I, I was like, basically, I, he says, that's what you're talking about is discipleship. They learn from your very example in a smaller group in a smaller environment. He says, now, why don't you do that with every teen in your parish? I was like, well, there's no way I could do all that with 100 teens or 200 or 300 or 400. I was like, the amount of time that I poured into those 10 took up like so much of my time. He says, exactly. He says, this is the problem in our church today. We think in terms of large groups and large numbers, and we think that that is the measure of success. When really, it's in a smaller environment, environment where um, the discipleship happens. The discipleship is the is the, the difference. He said, what would your youth ministry look like if instead of doing one large group meeting each week, you had 10 small groups that met with adults in the parish that could pour into them, not in classes, but in, in a way in which they share life together. Uh, they have fun together. They provide mentorship. They study the scriptures, they teach prayer and learn prayer, they have uh, deep friendships and relationships that form. He says, what if instead of one large group, he had 10 small groups? And I said, that's a really interesting concept. Uh, and this was like 10 years ago before small groups had, had taken off. And so that summer, uh, I, I started like two or three small groups in my parish. And eventually, uh, within a year's time, it had grown to 12 small groups. And we had doubled the number of teenagers uh, interest, uh, involved in our ministry. But uh, uh, we went from 60 teens coming to youth group to 120 in small groups because the teens responded so much more to um, small groups they actually t started telling their friends who weren't at youth group, this is really good. Um, but what was even more interesting is I actually followed those teens to see where did they end up and 80% of them are still practicing the faith. 
and, and actually that's held up in all of the parishes that I've worked with. It's anywhere from 80 to 95% coming out of small group ministry are still practicing the faith into college and adult life. Um, I share this with you. Like there, one of my inspirations for small group ministry is uh, Jan Taranowski. He was a, a Polish archi- uh, architect. Um, no, I'm sorry, a Polish tailor uh, that lived in uh, in uh, Poland in the in 1930s, 1930s and uh, he was um, just had a reputation for being a holy man of God. And when the Nazis came into Poland and invaded, they removed a lot of priests in the parishes that worked with young people that were, were running youth ministries because they didn't want them influencing a revolution against the Nazis. And this left a void in, in youth ministry. And so parishioners said, uh, you know, they went to a guy like Jan Ternowski. They were like, what, what can you do for our young, young people? He said, well, he says, I'll take on five young men. And he says, and I'll, and I'll form relationships with them, and I'll mentor them each week, and I'll teach them what I know, which is uh, and, and the spiritual works of St. John the Cross. Uh, and he did. He, he individually sought out five young men, and he would meet with these five men, uh, young adult men, each week. And uh, they formed very deep relationships with one another. And eventually he turned to the five, and he says, now I'm sending you out. I want you to work with 12 of the younger high school boys each like, just like Jesus worked with 12, I want you to work with 12. So they had 60 young men in uh, their youth ministry, five small groups apiece. He formed the mentors. The mentors formed the younger teens. Of those 60 young men, 10 of them became Catholic priests. Um, but not only did 10 of them become Catholic priests, one of them became Pope. Uh, Carol Wojtyla was one of the five that Jan Tanowski originally adopted. And one of the priests who was ordained alongside of him that also grew grew up in this ministry called the Living Rosary. He said, uh, Jan's influence with Carol was gigantic in, uh, in our lives. I can safely say that if it wasn't for him, neither Wojtyla nor I would be priests. Uh, Ternowski's cause is open and being studied for canonization right now. And I believe Ternowski had a greater impact on the 20th century than perhaps anybody else. Uh, it, if it weren't for Ternowski, he Pope John Paul II would have never become a priest. He would never become a pope and a great saint. Uh, the um, so much of his uh, his own pontificate and his own studies in theology came from the inspiration that Tiernowski gave him. Uh, and Tiernowski just had the intention and said, "I'll work with five. That's what I can do." I have this theory that I that I try to push in ministry. Anytime I'm doing workshops with people uh, in uh, in ministry or, or doing trainings or whatever the case may be, and I said, I want you to take a second and imagine uh, that your pastor comes to you tomorrow uh, or your bishop or, or whoever comes to you, whoever's in charge comes to you tomorrow. And they say, whatever you're doing in ministry right now, I, I want you to quit doing it. Uh, and, and it's not that it's, it's going to fall. Uh, somebody else is going to take care of it. I've got somebody else to do it. I've got a new job description for you. And whatever I'm paying you, uh, I'm going to double it. And you, some of you might be like, I'm a volunteer. He's like, okay, well, you can, I'm going to pay you enough that you can quit your job. Like I, the reason why I'm saying that is, is that uh, there's tremendous value in this job description. All right. So uh, it, this is an exercise. So imagine your pastor comes to you, says new job description. I want you to do it. He says your new job description is to make one saint, what would your ministry look like? If your entire responsibility was no longer your job, your current apostolates, all the young people you're responsible for, the programs you're responsible for, the sacramental formation, if none of that was your responsibility anymore and your only job was to find one person and make them a saint, what would your ministry look like? And the reason why I run this exercise is that frequently what people say is that, well, the way in which I invite people, the way in which I talk to people, the way in which I form people, the way in which I pray with people, the, uh, and the where I meet with people, all of that changes from what you're doing now. I've never said any, I've never met a person that when I say, okay, what, what would you do if you only had to make one saint? I've never said, met a person who said the exact same thing that I'm doing in my ministry right now. <laughs> but the, the reality is this is the exact way Jesus thought. When Jesus looked out into the crowds and he saw Simon, he didn't say, he didn't look at the crowds and say to himself, oh my gosh, how am I going to make all of these people into saints? He looked at Simon and he said, how do I make him Peter? 
And because if you look at the way Jesus operated, the most important ministry that he did was with the 12. And it was the 12 who, who changed the world. It wasn't his Sermon on the Mount. The only reason we know the Sermon on the Mount is because Matthew wrote it down. It wasn't his, uh, his great healings. People would have forgotten that had the apostles not written it down. His ministry with the apostles is what changed the world. And even among the apostles, and even among the 12, he had three that were most important that he poured into more than the other nine. And among the three, he had one that was more important. Uh, and that was Simon Peter. He looked not at the crowds, but rather at one and said, how do I make him St. Peter? And because of that, the change. Like, that's the mentality we need to have in ministry is what does it actually take to get somebody from where they are now to a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ and his church? And then once we identify this is what it actually takes, you can start to say, well, this is what my ministry needs to actually look like. And the reality is you can't do it all yourself, but it starts there. I have never seen a ministry uh, do, do like have tremendous fruit that started big. Like every big ministry that I know started like really small. Focus started with four missionaries on one college campus. Life Teen started with three people at one parish. Uh, you know, I could go down the list of, of different ministries that I know who are doing tremendous work and they all started small. Uh, so all of this to say, uh, what, when we move to discussion, I've got two things for you to talk about when we move to discussion. Um, and, and the two things that I want you to ask are who is one person that has mentored you in your faith and how would your ministry be different if you only had to focus in on one person? No, no, those, those are great. Take a breath. Uh, and if everyone could do me a favor, it's really hard if you haven't presented on, on zoom, it's, it's difficult. So could you use your reactions and just give the man a thumbs up? Because there's a lot of good content, and and because we're kind of like two parts, this is kind of a, a big broad brush. However, Everett, you really hammered us. I'm only seeing one or two thumbs up. I see Father Keys really focused on finding his reaction button. Well, well done. That's a good face. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if you read in the comments, but I was working really hard taking notes. I love that. Yeah, jazz hands, fantastic. And we are recording both of these. So uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about practicals of ministry. Like what did I do to actually make the small groups effective? How do you actually get it set up, et cetera? Uh, but I wanted to stay high level today. Is it just plant the seeds of here's what our mission is and uh, here's how we measure success and what I found to be most successful in doing so. So um, if you're, if you have a lot of questions about practicals, we're going to get into that more tomorrow. All right. So I'm going to put, I'm just going to create two uh, quick groups here. Um, ones um, as kind of a teaser for tomorrow I think it would be helpful there's two big pieces that uh, would uh, be applicable to the to the how to, to the practical mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you talked about youth culture and identifying what they need so touching on our, our culture today as our kids presently sit here what are their new needs and how do, how do we meet those needs without without doling down the integrity of the faith right because yeah. sometimes we say okay here's their needs we need to we, you know if we just had a better homily and a better sound system because that would meet their needs right so touching a bit on that and then which I'm, oh. I'm all for better homilies and better sound systems, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> can't tell you how many homilies I've heard where I'm just like, just make it end, make it right, end. Right, right. And then but, the modeling of behavior is really important. And, and from yep. this standpoint, if everybody on this call really dives into the idea of I'm just going to make one and I'm going to invest in that person, how do I do that at the same time understanding that I can't like just pull this kid aside and cut them off from the rest of the world? Right. And essentially, including their parents, all of this other behavior is being modeled that is counter to what we're trying to model. So that, that's a difficult one. Yeah. And, and those are the kinds of things that uh, we can, I think, definitely get into tomorrow. Uh, if it comes up in q and I'll try to address it quickly. Uh, but yeah, yeah the, the, parent, um, the parent that doesn't model is, is a huge challenge, which is why, you know, if your parish ministry is not ministering to parents simultaneously, uh, and I think ministering to parents um, 
looks different than what most parishes do. Uh, discussion. Uh, I'm I'm going to open up the floor for a few minutes. Uh, some highlights of your discussions. Uh, what did you hear from Everett? Questions that you want to throw at him? I have a, a list of notes uh, that that really I spoke with Everett, and it's stuff that we want to get into tomorrow, which is okay. This, but how now? This. So uh, the, the, the questions are bigger than what we can answer in about a couple <laughs> minutes. So. Uh, Father Keys, I just responded to your question there. Uh, Pat Barnes, Deacon Pat, you uh, you will not be with us tomorrow. I, I would certainly appreciate a, a closing blessing for us all and a, and a closing prayer for us all. From Father Keys. <laughs> oh! Father Keys, if you would. Father Keys, your blessing and prayer is going to be fantastic once you come off mute. Okay. What's the question? Uh, a final blessing and prayer for us. Okay. Benedictio Dei Omnipotenti, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen.